Yes. Should we start, I guess? Let's do that. Yes. So, so um, uh, yeah, I'm, uh, I'm Peter Hildenborg. I'm uh, one third seconded to uh, ESSD and SC, and I work on Macbeth. And I uh, am very uh, happy to introduce to you Emmanuel Bahi that uh, Kim and I, the investment is here also, Kim and I worked with uh, for one point uh, more than a half uh, decades, yeah. I think, um, since around the year 2000, I believe you did you. Well, we uh, are in, in, in the in year 2000, yes. So a couple of years before me. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. And, uh, yeah. So Emmanuel will talk about uh, a bit of Maxess, but uh, certainly I fit, which is a, a newer pet project. Yeah. yeah. Well, it's, I fit by itself is not a pet project. It's, <coughs> it's something which I've been working on for many years as well. But I started that after uh, spending time on Maxess. So uh, first I'd like to thank John for inviting me. Uh, <laughs> Much better. Yeah. And uh, so, well, uh, you all know Max Tass, you are all experts, so I will not spend too much time on that. And if you are there, that's because uh, you want to optimize things. Uh, you have nice instruments and you want to do more with them uh, because our brains are limited and sometimes you want to relax and transfer some of your thinking to a computer. So this is why I created a, a, an iFit package which can uh, work together with uh, Mextas uh, in order to run Mextas just like you would do with the interface or with the command line with uh, Mextas, but also automate the uh, optimization of, uh, of a simulation by playing with the parameters. So I'm currently working in the spectroscopy group and uh, so let's see what is in the menu. So I will first quickly introduce what is iFit and uh, what are the underlying objects. Uh, and explain that Maxess is just one criteria or one function that you can use as a model that you want to optimize. So uh, iFit has a Maxess command, just like you would run on a command line. And it performs single runs, scans, and optimizations. And I will uh, go on with a number of uh, examples. Uh, so I have uh, four or five examples. And going further, I will explain that uh, if uh, we can use this infrastructure to do even more uh, data analysis based on fits, because there's a fit, there's an optimizer. So you can do more than, by coupling instrument simulations, you can do more than just simulating an instrument. You can also use that in order to analyze real data. I will show that. So the tools I will use are, uh, to start with, Maxas, of course. You know that it, it, it is there to simulate all classes of instruments. And it has a number of uh, sample kernels or whatsoever. And then you can, you can label that. Uh, powders, liquids, colloids, single crystals. Uh, and most of these sample descriptions include cell shielding. And some of them include multiple scattering. And when you run the max simulation with a sample, you have an implicit uh, convolution from the sample uh, response with the instrument so that you record something which is uh, often non-trivial non to compute, uh, which is re really how it takes place on a real instrument. That is, you, you mix everything. So this is by implicitly you, you model the resolution of the instrument. And Maxpass is fully supported on, uh, on clusters. And uh, I have myself run Maxpass simulations on uh, more than 1,000 cores. And there's a wide community. This is why you are here. You are part of the community, of course. So the optimizers part will be done with IFIT. Uh, currently, there are 23 optimization routines. Uh, I will explain what this is. And the one I really like is the Swarm. The Swarm uh, is very robust. It's robust because it, it can um, cope with noise, because it's implicitly it's built with this. Uh, gradient routines like uh, Markov Devenberg and so on are not so um, robust when you input something which is noisy, like the next task simulation. But there are other optimizers I will explain. And also in these optimizers, you can choose the cost function. Basically, this is you want to maximize a monitor. Uh, and the constraints, you, you have to put limits, or you can put more constraints on that. 
Concerning the I.O., how to read and write simulations and results and visualize, I also use IPIT because it's quite small and it has a nice rendering using MATLAB. So IPIT, uh, there's a core functionality which is made of two classes only. There's a, a models class, which is, I call iFunk, and a data set class, which is iData. Uh, there's a set of uh, methods you can apply to these classes, and both for the models and the data sets. And uh, you can assemble things together by just using these operators. There's a lot of documentation, and uh, on top of this core, you have a number of libraries for uh, I.O., so to, to be able to support a number of data formats, a set of optimizers, and a, a library of predefined models as well. For the I.O., currently, um, I can read 73 data formats. Uh, this is basically um, Nexus, of course, uh, image sys, uh, EDF format from ESI, so a number of, plenty of other formats. Uh, I can export in uh, 33 formats, 34, so it means you can use IFIT, you can see it, just like an import-export tool as well, you can use that. And it can read and write Nexus and maintain the flavors of Nexus, also for length and so on. Included for the models, I can read models uh, which are stored in files, in file formats, and I can export in a number of other formats. There are these optimizers, and I currently have uh, 53 predefined models, that is, mathematical expressions. So these are symbolic objects. But you can then assemble all these objects together using the methods which are assigned to the models, uh, these iPhone objects. So out of these bricks, legal bricks, uh, predefined models, you can build much more complex uh, models out of that. Including for the infrastructure, the, uh, it runs either using MATLAB, which I will use on this uh, laptop, but you can also have it as a standalone application which does not require a license and still provides uh, nearly uh, fully functional uh, MATLAB interface, or um, you, you have complete flexibility. You can use it with a prompt entering commands from MATLAB, and this is for free. Uh, there's a Python interface, uh, which is experimental, and I plan in the future to interface with Julia, which is another uh, mathematical uh, language, which is known to be extremely fast. Uh, so to handle large data sets and uh, using full um, parallelization uh, on, on the modern computers. So it's very fast. Uh, I think it comes with a few um, GUIs, but not so many because at the beginning I wanted the, the tool to be robust, so I invested time not on blah blah and the appearance, but only on the mathematics and, and the functionalities on the, to be solid. But still, I have a, a Misfit interface, which is a mixture between the old MFIT, which was developed by, uh, in, in the UK, uh, and uh, something which, which is IFIT, and it's called my Misfit. And also, I have an interface for this, uh, resolution functions, which is called Resica, which is a mixture between Rescal from the Brookhaven in the 50 years ago, and Wesley from the LUDEF. Uh, so this made a resid count. So the code is freely available on, uh, on the iFit website, but also on GitHub. And you can contribute to the project, you can uh, fork and uh, do merge requests, as you all do, of course. So for the installation, if you have a MATLAB uh, already, then you grab the code, and you just have a single line, which is to add the path to uh, the iFit directory. That's it. And then it's functional. If you do not have MATLAB, you just get the standalone version, you install it, there's an executable, so for Windows, there's an installer. For Mac OS X, there's a DMG uh, with an app. And for Debian uh, packages, uh, sudo app get installed, iFit, and then you can have it. Uh, and you start iFit just by issuing the command iFit. And this is free, no license required. For the objects, there are two types of objects, as like I said. Uh, one which is a data set uh, on the left side, and usually you will fill the data set with a file, but it could also be a stream or just an array from the memory or somewhere. So you can, you can fill the object with some data. It contains basically the raw data as it is input, 
and it has uh, the ability to create links inside the object so they can point, you can define aliases uh, which have given names that you want to use to some area which are hidden in the data structure. This way you, you uh, expose only a portion of the data sets uh, to your usage and it makes things much easier. Uh, one of, some of these aliases, of course, are the signals, the error bar, and the money set. These ones are mandatory, but they are automatically set if you don't do that. And currently, there is nearly 200 methods for these objects. Uh, sinus, uh, or, or all trigonometric functions, uh, convolution, FFT, and so on. I will shortly explain that afterwards. For the models on the right side, uh, it's about the same. It's an object, but you mostly fill it with either an expression. So you just give the expression uh, p of 1, which is first parameter, times x, the axis, plus p of 2. This is a slope. Okay, this is a straight line. You can just bring the expression directly and fill the object, and all the rest will be guessed automatically. Or you can load a file, and you can also uh, get models predefined and then make more advanced models. As these are objects, they are uh, uh, self-assembled, so you can save them and give it to uh, your neighbor, and they will be able to use the object. Everything is self-contained. There are 71 methods currently and 53 predefined models. All these can be assembled. You can have a Gaussian, for instance, and a Laurentian. You can apply convolution operator. You get a void function. So convolution or void uh, is like that. This is the definition. And it creates this symbolically. So you don't have, it does not correspond to a numerical convolution. It's, it's simple. If you mix these two objects, you make a fit. You fit a model onto a data set. And this is as simple as that. For the objects, uh, for the data set objects, let's make a list of the unary operators. Of course, you have uh, on the uh, right side, on, uh, on the uh, left side, you have the, uh, all the uh, unary operators. Exponential, uh, peak finding, integration, and 50. On the uh, right side, you have everything which combines the number of objects, and they, they all work on arrays. Um, so you can have, you can combine a hundred of um, objects in a single operation. This makes merging, uh, so computing the intersection, adding the data there, using parts which are not in the intersection to to uh, to uh, complement the data set, and so on. So you have plenty of um, freedom to use all these methods. Uh, basically, it, it is, all the methods are, can resample the data accordingly to if they do not match an axis. And they also extend the dimensionality when it is required. This is automatic. For the models, there are 71 methods currently. It's, all, it's the same. You will find about the same methods for unary operations. And binary expressions uh, will be assembled this way, plus, minus, and uh, divide, and so on. So you can uh, divide a model by another one. You can add a model onto another one. And you can also have a FFT, convolution, and more advanced stuff. So how do you use Maxstat in there? Maxstat, it's a program which works on, a, which runs, and it models an instrument. It has parameters. So it looks like a model. In a way, you have parameters which are assigned to a model, and you have some results which are data sets created by the uh, simulation. So the only thing you need to create a model in IFIT is to be able to launch a simulation or a MAXA simulation using some parameters. So it spawns an uh, executable, uh, executes a simulation, and then reads back the generated uh, data files. And this is then exposed onto the MATLAB uh, workspace. If you use that, as a number, basically, you will you want to optimize a monitor output that is a flux or the gradient somewhere. You want to maximize this number. It's a scalar value, which is integration of your monitor, basically. And this, uh, when it's used as a number or as a criteria, you want to maximize or minimize directly. This is just an optimization criteria. If you want to do fitting, then the optimization criteria will be that you will have to input a data set, evaluate a model that is a MaxPass simulation onto these data sets, and then make a comparison between the real data set, the measurement, and, and the, the model, which is a MaxPass simulation. And then you have a fit. So this methodology for the two aspects, 
is being used in the next task command, but as well in the read belt uh, model, which is also part of the predefined uh, models uh, in IFIT. And uh, may add more in the future, of course. Next task command, and this is where you want, this is where most of the information you want is, this is the slide, the master slide, okay? The first thing is you want to read Nextas directory. So this is a result from a simulation. You just convert the directory name into an iData object, and it gets you a list of objects which is stored here in the monitors array, and you can then plot these monitors. This is how you read a data set uh, or a set of data sets. You can also uh, run a single simulation, and this means you will uh, in, use a next task command with uh, as a first argument you will put the instrument uh, you want to use, then uh, the parameters you want to use, and, and then more parameters for the end count, the number of nodes you want to use, and so on. But these are exactly the same syntax as when you use the next task in the command line in scripts, or when you read what is written to the console when you use the, the next task GUI. Uh, this is for a single next task simulation, and, and you get back at the results the same as in just reading the Mexas directory results. That is a variable which is called monitors here, which contains the set of iData objects, which are the monitors. If you want to do a scan, instead of a single, uh, for, for the, the single Mexas simulation, I use the, the vertical curvature of a monocometer in the template diffractor meter being equal to one meter. And for the, the set or uh, uh, the scan of the parameter, <coughs> the example is just I use the same syntax, exactly the same, but instead of a single value, I just set a number of values between brackets. And here there's a three step, uh, three steps scan uh, from 0 0.5 to 1.5. And this makes then uh, you can either get the integral value of the, of the monitors. This is given as the first returned argument uh, integral in this example. And the scan is an array of arrays. Uh, each array is uh, all the results of the simulation. And you get an array of this because there's one per scan. So it's a multi-dimensional array of scans. This is for, for one-dimensional scan, but you can do multi-dimensional scans. And then uh, you just have to put more than one variable to vary. Here, in this example, I, use, uh, I change the uh, radius of curvature for the monochromator, but also the length between the monochromator and the sample, okay, L2. This makes a two-dimensional scan. This is different as in MaxTask, because in the MaxTask GUI, when you, do, when you vary two parameters, it, it, they, it, they, they, are, they follow a line, and they evolve uh, in parallel. In here, so you cannot do multi-dimensional scans in the MaxTask GUI, but in here you can do multi-dimensional scans with a limit, which is that if you add more and more uh, dimensions to the scan, of course, you will have more and more simulations to perform, which means that in the end, you have to um, wait a long time. Because if, uh, if you vary 10 parameters, each of them being a scan, then uh, you wait forever. Well, it depends on your computer, of course. Now, if you want to optimize an instrument, the only difference to all of these it's just that you have to specify that the mode for operation is optimization. So you specify mode equals optimize. And this is all. And then what it does is that instead of doing a regular scan with a binning which is fixed or the values you, you specify, it will define the min and the max for the, uh, the boundaries of the space you want to explore. And then here it goes. It's as simple as that. So this is exactly the same syntax with an optimization flag set. Uh, what is still uh, important is, is you, you would like to restrict uh, reading the detectors because this will speed up the, the, uh, the phase of I.O. for reading the files and so on. So it could be a good idea to, to also add, uh, to specify the list of monitors you want to read. In this case, I specify that I want to read monitors which, are, which contain the word banana because this is a banana detector and the diffractor matter. So all the detectors which match this word will be, be read, but this is not all the detectors. And this allows to, to um, get to, to recover time or not spend too much time reading the files. But what are you optimizing for? Which programs? Yeah. So here I optimize the banana detector. So is that in total intensity or? Uh, yes. Or is it? 
So you can, you can if you say it like that, yeah. you will uh, you will use the integrated intensity. But there are syntaxes you will see in the documentation. You can specify, for instance, that you want the banana, but you want to divide by the half width of it. So you, then you will have another criteria. You can build up expressions instead of giving a single name. You can give it an expression which contains something you want to compute out of a number of detectors. So you specify the detectors you want to work with, and then you give the expression you, how you assemble the detectors to create a new criteria. And this will be the criteria to, to maximize or minimize. You can run the optimizer either by minimizing or, or maximizing something. By default, you want to maximize. This is usually you want to maximize the radiance or the flux. So this is the master slide where you will uh, mostly run everything here. The advantage is that, of course, it runs from MATLAB, and you can uh, put that in a file, and you can run it uh, iteratively. Uh, and you can also do optimizations, and then wait some time. And in the end, you will uh, get the results, which are the best uh, criteria value, and you will get the parameters which correspond to this uh, op optimized solution. So uh, MC run or, uh, is used in the back of uh, the max task run in Alphit. So you need to specify sometimes, well, often MC run will be found. But on macOS, uh, the MC run is deeply buried, in some cases, into the applications folder and so on, because this is a Mac uh, application. Then it could be that you have to specify where MC run is. For these cases, uh, you will just um, use an option which states MC run is here. You can alternatively, of course, specify or set, change the path to the executable so that it points in, inside some application folder where the executables are. I think uh, Peter has been working in this process for installation of macOS so that you have aliases which are also created to the user local bin in uh, recent uh, installers for MacStack. But if it's not the case, you, can, you have the flexibility to specify where the MC run is, which is also interesting. This may also be the case that MC run on uh, Windows requires an extension .pl or .py and something like that. And then it could be that you have to specify that here. But it gives the freedom to adapt to the system. MPI works uh, usually uh, smoothly. In some cases, uh, that could be uh, on a specific system. For instance, Windows is it, it, not so trivial to install uh, open MPI and link it with, uh, with MacStats uh, directly. You know. Uh, then you may have to do uh, some tuning on your system, but usually you can use MPI with optimization or the, any single run, and it requires, of course, you require to install MPI. The optimizer uh, is usually the uh, swarms. It's a particle swarm optimizer which is chosen by default, but you can also specify as an option the optimizer you want to use, and there's a wide number of optimizers. So let's uh, go to the examples. So Matt is here, so <coughs> nice, because the first example is a guy bot, and this is probably uh, one of the earliest uh, power user of iFit. Matt, he, he was here, and he said, ah, there's something for optimization. I will just put a very complex, or build a very complex guide model with hundreds of elements, and I will request for optimization. And this is why iFit is, is, has been built. And I have validated I fit up to more than 100 parameters to change. So you can optimize very large and uh, very complex uh, systems. And this works. So uh, uh, the guidebook builds a MaxTAS model from specifications. It defines all instrument parameters, and then it launches an optimization step on that. And you recover the full geometry of the optimized um, uh, guide that you want in the end to produce basically the maximum brilliance at the end of the guide, so the best transfer from the source to the, to the um, basically to the uh, primary spectrometer or to the sample or detector. It's been used, as far as I know, for camera and defrost, but I think it, it, uh, it was distributed in, at some people. I don't know if you've been using that in the past. For the availability, unfortunately, you have to ask Matt, because I could not find it on the web. But it's also a script, which is, in a way, you have, as far as I understood, it's a script which, is, which you have to play with. So there's not one distribution. It's just that there's a principle uh, that I understand, 
And there's a set of examples that Matt can uh, can explain to you if you need that. Okay. The second example is just a diffractor matter. Uh, in this example, I've been varying four parameters, and the idea was to maximize the flux on the detector um, with constraints on the collimations, so that I get more intensity on the diffractor gram of all powder. So in here, I started from uh, the start column here for four parameters. And what is found is that there are many equivalent solutions. If you run that many times, starting from different locations or using different optimizers, you may find equivalent solutions at different places. But these places, the phase space, are not so distant one to the other. So in this example, we can see uh, on the right side that there's a um, there are two plots. Once we displays uh, the minus of the criteria, that is, you want to max to, to uh, uh, well, by default, you minimize the function. So if you do minus uh, the criteria, you minimize uh, the, the uh, opposite of the flux, basically here. That is, you maximize the flux. So in here, we start from basically minus 4, 10 to the minus 3 counts per second. And at the end, we have uh, 12,000 counts per second, so we have multiplied by a factor of three the number of counts on the, on the detector. The other panel uh, or plots on, on the right side with the arrow show we start from the red dot. This was the initial uh, uh, start location. And gradually, the optimizer has been evolving, trying a number of uh, different uh, solutions in the phase space of the parameters. And it evolves to another location where the optimization has been concentrated around the uh, red square. And, and indeed, there was an improvement. So this allows, uh, you can only plot up to three uh, space parameters because above, you can't just see that. Or it could be that if you have it in time, but it's not very easy. So you can see uh, up to three parameters and see the trajectory of the search in, in the space of the parameters up to the three first uh, parameters. And in the bottom uh, uh, plot, you can see the comparison between, in red, the starting configuration, and in blue, uh, the final one. If you put constraints on the, for instance, the final collimation, alpha 3, on the detector, then you retain the resolution of the instrument in, in peak. And that means all the, the benefit is just in flux. So basically, it shows that by just relaxing a little the collimations, you, you, can, you can find better, much better solution than that what is usually built on real facilities. Uh, and this, and you can also do optimization at uh, varying more parameters if you, if you want to. Of course, all, the, all, the, all of the parameters should better be bound uh, between limits so that you do not allow the optimizer to go at infinite numbers of parameters because then first the search is longer, and you may get unphysical meaning for the parameters. So it's much better. It helps a lot. And I highly encourage you to bound the parameters. And there is a syntax for that. Another example is uh, there was a request from uh, WPRNU at DLL to um, optimize a focusing node. It's made of 112 uh, polygons. They are all flexible. So it's, it's kind of, um, you, you just get plates. Just like I would say, you see, um, well, you have plenty of plates, and you can change their orientation and the arrangement so that it's completely fuzzy. At the beginning, it can vary, uh, just like a snake. And of course, you have plenty of parameters in there, because all of these are independent. But by using symmetry, you can reduce the number of parameters, because the plate has a square shape, and so on. So all these, the, the polygons are not really uh, standing in space. They have to touch one to the other. So by, by using that, you reduce the number of parameters. However, you still have, in the end, 41 free parameters. And the idea is to focus the beam uh, from the monochromator onto a tiny area where you want to pulse the uh, high magnetic field uh, uh, up to 60 tesla, something like that. It's pulsed. Uh, so it's, uh, you have one pulse every, um, I think, uh, every minute. But the pulse lasts only a few uh, milliseconds. That's how it is. But you have high intensity, and it's very cheap to build. It costs uh, 10,000 euros to get this. 
only. And you have post postfield. If you want more information, you just uh, contact with the INU or, or I can give you that. So the model contains the full guide. So you start from the uh, from the source, and at the end you can see the, the uh, at 60 at 70 meters you can see the primary spectrometer of uh, of the instruments uh, with a, a zoom in uh, showing the the nose in in uh, green, and there's about 106 uh, megapascal components in there. Okay, so this is uh, what is being Currently running, I will show you uh, right now, and I will uh, go on further with the uh, with the with the um, presentation. So, uh, using my computer at home or at my home institute, it takes a few seconds these days. Fifteen seconds was with my old computer. I think these days you could use five seconds run uh, using all the CPUs. On this laptop, every iteration takes thirty seconds. And for I will show you that I've been using the particle swarm optimizer, and uh, I'm searching for for the best configuration of these 41 parameters, starting from a, a kind of uh, mixture between a straight and a, and a parabolic uh, configuration of the of the guy. And this is a, it takes a few hours. So each iteration shows the monitor's uh, results. I will just show you that. So I go there. It is here. So currently, it's running. So it's using, as you can see on the top here, this is the neutron counts, or the power of the, of the, uh, of the ESS, of course. So this <laughs> is running, and it's full power. It's uh, already a uh, five megawatt source. So uh, this is the results of the uh, monitors we are optimizing. This is in the course of the optimization. So you will see that after some time, it will update. So every iteration brings and, and displays the results. Uh, it's now finishing the, the stuff, so it will be. This, yeah. You've seen the monitors have just changed. That is one after uh, one iteration after the other. So we started from here, and globally we we have set up a swarm of different positions in the phase space of the parameters, 41 dimensions, and all these uh, ants are evolving in this space randomly. But with some older skill, uh, they are searching for for uh, the optimum. And every time there is an iteration, we display the results, which are uh, I selected four monitors out of the num numerous monitors of the simulation, and these are used as the uh, optimization optimization criteria to maximize everything at the same time. And you can see that from the beginning, there has been an improvement already. It requires a few hundred iterations. And then you find the best solution. And at every iteration, so this is, these are on the uh, left side, you can see the uh, real space image. On the right side, this is a divergence of the beam. Uh, the, um, in the middle of the focusing nose and at the sample location. So the top is in the middle, and at the bottom, you have uh, the uh, sample location. And you can see that the beam size is indeed of a few millimeters. Okay. This is two millimeters. So it, it runs like that for, for hours. Okay. But it runs. It's now running. So I'm coming back to the uh, to the uh, up here. And I will have a slide. And I don't know how to restart from uh, there. Yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. It's probably here. Start from current slide. Update. Yeah. Okay, so back to it. You see that after 500 iterations, you have converged. So from the beginning, you clearly see an evolution. Of course, as it is a random search, or um, uh, there is a strategy which is based on random, but it's not completely random. So, but but uh, one uh, one iteration after the other, slowly, even though there is noise, because this is Monte Carlo, and the optimizer is also noisy. Then gradually we converge to a much better solution. And you see that we started from there, in here. Uh, and gradually we have been evolving to a, a cloud of solutions, which is not where we started. It is definitely at a, another location in the phase space. Of course, I cannot show the phase space in 41 dimensions, sorry. But uh, three dimensions is already enough. So you can see that here I had 538 iterations, and I use this one. 
So this is what I can get. Basically, a factor three in flux, and the, the, the guide was built, and there's a factor three in flux for 50 kilo euros. It's not so expensive. Okay. And uh, you can also conclude that there's no need to hide. You can specify the coating you want at different locations, and then reduce the cost. So you can, for the top and the bottom, you only need M equals 4. And for the sides, you, you could make with M equals 5. There's no need to go to M equals 6, because you only bring 1% more flux, which, which is just a waste of money. And it also converges to a nose which is uh, 87 centimeters long. So it's not so long. It, it's still quite compact. And the profile of this nose, which is here shown as a result, is not parabolic. It's a mixture of something. The kind of uh, uh, parabolic elliptic something. Okay. And this is a um, result of the four monitors I was showing during the iteration. Okay. So, so can it be built? It was built. It was built. Okay. It was built. Okay. But one of the criteria for doing this is also that there is a manufacturing issue because it's false and, and because there's a high magnetic fields, you have you necessarily have stray fields. And if you as the super mirror contains uh, magnetic uh, atoms, you have Laplace currents which are created in the nose itself when you implement S. So you have to discuss with uh, Swiss Intronix so that you can um, uh, use substrates which uh, do not contain too many uh, um, uh, magnetic uh, atoms, because else you will have either uh, you heat in a way, when you have a pulse, you will heat uh, the nose, the focusing nose, or you can have deformation because of, uh, of uh, just the magnetic field forces. So it's not only the simulation, you also have to do the real stuff. That is, you have to build it, and you have to qualify it, and you have to study the mechanics and uh, the constraints on the building. Yeah. Uh, as I say, simulation is just a tool. Your brain does better than any simulation. And when you, so it's just a tool and you have to go forward. It's just to help you understand things, to trigger something in your brain, and then you go forward. OK, so another uh, example is the D2B uh, optimization. So D2B is a, uh, it's a high resolution target diffraction map. And this time I've been varying six parameters. It takes about an hour to optimize on my computer at home. And I, I repeated that for all the optimizer I had because this instrument exists and it's very, uh, it was expensive to build. So I had to be, to be very convincing when I presented the results to the directors. Uh, so I had to compare all the optimization um, solutions which I found and to, uh, to draw definitive conclusions. Uh, let's be frank, it was not used. Uh, for some reason, I will explain. But first, the results show that the simulated peak profiles mimic the data. Here in, in the, uh, on the right side, you can see the data set uh, is in blue and magenta. The magenta is only using the central part of the detector where the resolution, resolution is best. And the blue one adds three times the flux because the central part is only one third. So you have three times the flux on the uh, full uh, blue line. And the magenta has been multiplied by three in order to exhibit the uh, improvement in resolution in here. And this is true. This is real data on the NACALF uh, target. Uh, what I've been uh, doing is that uh, by using the optimizer, you can show that you can get the same flux as the full detector, but with the resolution of the central part. So you have a factor of three flux, neat flux, okay? But so it's possible to improve the flux and the resolution at the same time, or retain the resolution but improve the flux. It allows to use a full detector with a data quality which is equivalent to the best uh, central area of the detector. Uh, also, currently the detector is moving. You have it's a scanning instrument. That is, you uh, as the, the cells of the detector um, are quite distant, in order to build a fine grid. Uh, a fine diffractogram, you have to <clears throat> make 32 images or 25 images uh, or scans of the detector position. And then you assemble all these frames 
fields of the uh, so that is one thing uh, equipment uh, brings one and points okay and you rotate and turn the gas this is the problem so we propose a new geometry you don't need that because the combination on the relaxed and then you can use twenty five in measurement time because you don't scan a factor three improvements on the flux and retain resolution. So it's a factor 25 in flux. This is something. It wasn't done. Yeah. And the reason is just uh, we are human beings, you know. So um, computers are just uh, machines. And uh, it's not just um, a question of uh, showing results. What happens is that the instrument runs these days. And it's already quite good. And if we would build a new detector, it would cost, let's say, 2 million euros. It's not much. But still, you have to, uh, in a way, stop the instrument or at least divert the scientists on the instrument or to other tasks. And then they are less productive in the science and the proposals and so on. And then it was decided not to do anything because they said there is a risk that it doesn't work. Indeed, this is true. It's just a, an estimate. So they decided not to do it. My point of view is that it would have succeeded, but I'm not responsible for that, for the decision of following on. Also, um, yeah, that's uh, how it is. Raw numbers are not all. You have to convince people as well. I think it's today possible to go beyond just optimization of instruments. Um, we have instruments and you have parameters. We create data sets. You can compare data sets with measurements and then it means you can do a fit. Uh, usually what, how we treat the data is that we get raw data. We reduce it, that is we remove all the junk which is in the data and we try to reduce the amount of data as well. And we correct by a number of things we know they happen and they are very nasty background, the efficiency of detectors, uh, some dead angles, things like that. And then you reintroduce, in a way, in your model, you introduce a convolution, and then you compare at the end some kind of transfer data with a model which has been also touched in a way to, in a way to mimic the response of the instrument. And then you fit the two of these. And it gets something which is it does work. Everybody has been doing like that for 60 years. But there's something which is puzzling in here because first, by reducing the data, you modify it. And you modify it in a way, of course you know how it's modified. Or most people know that. Or some people know that. But, um, <clears throat> but as far as you start to modify the data, then it's not a real data. You may have introduced bias in the, in the reduction. It's not perfect. And when you convolve as well, you have to, in a way, uh, choose a resolution function. And most people don't know the four-dimensional resolution function in, a, in a HKL and energy. <coughs> so they, they use a Gaussian. The Gaussian is not enough, actually. It's a single one-dimensional function. And, uh, well, it's still better than nothing, of course. But most people just do, so you have on the two sides, it's, uh, it's not satisfactory in a way. But it does work, everybody that does like that. I think there is another route, which is, I will call it data reconstruction, or it could be <coughs> virtual experiment fitting, something like that. So what you do is that the reduction and the convolution are part of your model, and the model is a combination of the instrument plus the sample. So it must be a virtual experiment. Kind of. You can do that with next task, but I will show that it could also be done with another tool or just a strategy. That is, you have first to assemble a model which contains everything. And you compare, it produces a raw data set. And then you compare, you fit on a raw data set and you access the, the parameters of the model, which then give you the physical meaning of your experiment. So 
the physics has to be part of the model. And this is also a blocking part because you need then sample kernels which are advanced. <coughs> and you have to um, also include all the imperfections of your uh, instrument into the model. And this, when you say all the imperfections, it cannot be true because you never know all the imperfections. There are always imperfections you ignore. But at least you will try to put as much imperfections as you can guess at the detector level, at the optic level, at the sample environment, and so on. So you, you, you push the imperfections in the model. And then you fit everything at the same time on the raw data. This is a route which is today possible because we have computers which have plenty of cores. And most of the time, we don't use all these cores. That's a pity. So it would be much better to use them. And as I, as I showed, <coughs> an optimization is a few hours. If the result brings a benefit compared to the usual reduction, then you're, you're, you can wait a few hours to get more accuracy in the data analysis. This you can do. And today, it's a few hours. But in a few years' time, it will be a few minutes. Okay. And even today, on a large cluster, it would be a few minutes. So this is feasible. So let's uh, see how, what it gives on a, a dynamic science path. <coughs> the conventional one is that you start from reduction. So reduction is the first step. <coughs> and once you get reduction, you uh, transform the data into something which has a meaning. <coughs> and then you compare it to the model. And it contains convolution and so on. And this, uh, you can put modeling of a sample. Or it could be something very advanced. But still, you have to go this route. And I believe. And the raw data is completely at the beginning of the path. And you see that the number of steps to go to the science path is quite long. If you get a second route, you do not pass through reduction. You start from raw data. And you compare them actually. Everything is in, the, is in the full simulation. And you do the fit. This route, of course, on this graphic is very small. But in reality, you have to, to feed the model with something. Okay? But this, all, everything, all the bricks are there. They are there. And I just give an example. The ideas can be done in any language, any tool. It's just that it takes time to, to build that. But it's possible. Let's see what has been done for the Jupiter Peace Group. So I've been um, <coughs> in the spectroscopy group for, uh, since last July. And uh, the directors at the ALL requested that I would provide a tool to help uh, users on the Jupiter Peace machine, not the scientists, the users. It should be a simple tool to do fitting, <coughs> taking into account the resolution function in four dimensional space, plus all the other thing you can imagine. It must be simple. I must be able also to model components or <coughs> complex dispersions. <coughs> it can be phonons. I will drink something here. Sorry. But it can also be uh, spin waves or other things. So you need, first you need a model of uh, an instrument. So these days, the triple axis machines are models uh, with analytical um, approaches. One of these is called Cooper Nathans. It's very uh, old fashioned, uh, very approximative. Another one is Popovici. Uh, not Popovici, uh, Bochi, yeah, it's Vici. Uh, and this one is more advanced because it takes into account focusing analyzers and so on. And, and monopolators. So it's, it, it's a step further. And it's, it's supposed to be, or most people think, or believe, that, and they are, they are true, it's enough to do something with it. As it is analytical, the evaluation is very fast. It, it takes a few milliseconds to evaluate the model in four dimensions everywhere in the brilliance of the world. What I've done uh, on top of that, first, there is a number of implementations of the Kubernetes and the Popovici that are wandering around. So I found four implementations of Kubernetes, two of uh, Popovici, and I added a full model for triple axis using Mextat. That is, there is no analytical approach. It's just Monte Carlo. Of course, there are approximations. There are in, in the monochromator description, for instance. But 
still, compared to the analytical uh, equations, it's still a progress because it's supposed to be more accurate in the geometry or description of complex uh, instruments. So Reslet Cal is the result of this step. It's, called, it's a mixture of Red Cal and Reslet. And the interface is shown on the right side. <coughs> Uh, you can uh, feed the interface uh, with numbers coming from data sets or from predefined configurations. And you can save the interface and so on. Well, you can work with it just like the modern uh, tool. And it's, uh, it also allows to, to um, <coughs> show the resolution and, and do scans in 3D and so on. So it's, it, I will show match loss. So of course, when you start off um, four dimensions for the triple axis machine, then the data set should be four dimensions as well. And as you record a scan, you have to evaluate it not as a single vector of numbers. You have to say this is a, a set of events in, the H in four dimensional space, HKL energy. So these are events. You know that in method, it's all events. Uh, it's the same here, and it, especially this is true for multiplex uh, triple axis machines where <coughs> all of the channels will give you some coordinates of uh, universal space, and these are not on the line. They, do, they, are, they look like parabolas, but if you do a scan of these, what you have is then a set of points in four dimensions, if, especially if you rotate the sample at the same time or afterwards. <coughs> it, it's a, if you do a you can do a number of scans to, to, um, on the triple axis machine or the multiplex to really probe a four-dimensional four space and fill it with, uh, with uh, events. This is the same what you do on a time of flight machine when you do acquisition on a multi-detector and then you also do scans of the, you rotate the sample. You do the same. So the model must be four dimensions and you have, uh, you have different uh, possibilities in IFIT. There is one which uh, is devoted to problems, and I use the SpinW package from uh, Sandor Fox uh, at PSI to uh, use the SpinWaves, to model SpinWaves. But there are other models which can be used, including local expansions around uh, the center of your scan, for instance. Then you assume that dispersions can be expanded in a series, and then you describe locally the dispersion, or you fit locally the dispersion, and then you can fit your data set with asymmetries and so on, given by the curvature of the dispersion, for instance. Then what you do, once you have the resolution function and the model, you create a new model, which is the convolution of the triple axis machine by the dispersion you, ha you have in the model. And this line, the number four, takes a second. There's no, it's, it's symbolic, so there's no computation. You just say, this is convolution, this is on your object. And then you do the fit, data and model. So it's in, uh, in the strategy, it's extremely simple, and it does work. So I show you here two um, examples of, uh, of dispersions you can compute with IFIT. Uh, on the left side, you have components from aluminium, FCC, and uh, I'm coupling uh, IFIT with a DFT code, and this coupling is done through the ASC, uh, Atomistic Simulation Environment from DTU. So what you do is you input a structure. It can be a SIF file, or PTV, or a POSCA from BASP. And then you request ASC to compute the forces. And this is done by a number of displacement of the atoms. Each iteration gives you the forces uh, using VFT. You get back this. And then you are able to evaluate the forces or the dispersions everywhere in the brilliant zone. So the limiting part is indeed the evaluation of the forces. This takes time, but it depends how you do it. Uh, currently, ASC has some limitation in the number of displacements you can do. Uh, it's not uh, because you, you, are, you are limited in the number itself. It's just like it has too many displacements, so the simulation time is long. But I'm working uh, to reduce that you know, with the ASC guys. Uh, and I think can couple through ASC to a number of codes like uh, BASP, of course, Quantum Espresso, uh, Abinit, and ELK, and others. Uh, this one was used, uh, I've been computing this one with Quantum Espresso, and it takes a minute to do that. It takes a minute to compute the forces. Once the model has been created, it's an object, you can save it, 
you get it back and you can evaluate the dispersion everywhere and it takes 10 seconds to evaluate this, this one. So the limiting part is not the evaluation of the dispersion, it's computing the forces. But you can do that in advance. And then uh, when you run your experiment or when you do the picking, you don't need to recompute the forces. You just quickly evaluate the uh, dispersion. And on this graphic, on the, on the left one, there's uh, about 2 million evaluation of the, um, uh, of the model. And this takes 10 seconds. So you see it's very fast, one evaluation. So if you now um, think about, let's fit with a triple axis scan. A triple axis scan will have, let's say, 20 points. It is less than a few million points here. So the evaluation will be immediate. Okay. So the limiting part is to compute the forces. The evaluation of the dispersion is really fast, really fast. Uh, so uh, for this, they die fit. There is some Python layer <coughs> underneath uh, using ESC and some of my code. On the right side, it's the same using the spin that you package from Sundor. As you see, you, so you create the model first, but uh, as opposed to the phonons, the creation of the model in, uh, with Sandor uh, SpinW is nearly immediate, but the evaluation is longer, so it takes longer time. So to create this map in 10 seconds, it's about a minute. I think you can wait for a few million points in a minute, it's still okay. You can still uh, fit a triple axis scan on this. Of course, you will only need a line in here. So it, it just here, I plot the complete uh, brilliant zone. You see it goes from 0 to 1.5, so you have a one and a half brilliant zone there. So, and now a lot of points. It's the same for the other one. You have also the full brilliant zone. Of course, you cannot plot the brilliant zone itself because it's four dimensions. <coughs> Here it's a projection on the uh, kh uh, equals zero plane. Okay? And you can add these models because these are functions. These are objects. Like you can add, you can say, okay, I have a spin wave plus a tonon, and I want to fit all of this. This works. These are two objects, the A plus B, and you have a new object which contains everything. This works. So let's come back to the triple axis. If you do a scan, this is typically you would do an energy scan. For each of the position of the scan, you can evaluate the um, resolution function. This one has been evaluated with using Mextas model. And with Mextas model, you evaluate uh, the resolution as a set of events which are recorded at the detector because this is Monte Carlo. Out of that, you are able, for, just for visualization, uh, visualization, I just compute the ellipsis, which is enclosed in the points. But I don't use it for, for the convolution. What I use is the Monte Carlo points. And for each of the points of the class here, you compute the model, which I showed. And then you do the sum of it, which makes then the intersection of the resolution with the dispersion. And this is a signal you record on a triple axis machine. The geometry of, uh, of the instrument is shown on the right side. You can see the neutrons are coming from the bottom right side, and then the enter the monochromator. And as it is a scan, you can see that there are different geometries overlaid on, uh, on these graphics. This is part of the Reslip cam. You can also see the direct geometry of the instrument in the real space. Uh, and you can see how the term will move, for instance. In terms of um, of commands you need to do all this. Four commands only. The first one, you import your, your task data. The second, you make it, you, you make it, you, you go through the triple axis interface to, to say, okay, this is four dimensions. So it will search for the HKL axis and so on and make it an event list, which then I store in the D4D, uh, I call it like that. Then you create a, a model, which here could be SQ Omega forums. And then you fit the data set D or D4D, whether it will be D4D, sorry. But you have to convolve the, uh, the model with the resolution as well of the instrument. And this is done also with the rescal or resleaf count uh, command. So you, uh, you then, the final line is just fit the, the uh, four dimensional data set from the task with the convoluted data uh, model from the task. Okay. And this, creates a fit. This is for four lines. Okay. It, it could be that the uh, phone computation takes time. Sorry. But the rest does not. So, 
Uh, let's see a last example, which I like uh, also a lot, which is an example of what you can do with, indeed, this data reconstruction. In this example, uh, I focus on the read belt refinement. Of course, uh, this is not time of flight. Here, it's a, it's a constant source, but it could also apply to time of flight, of course. So you input, in a, in a normal read belt, you input a, a structure. This is, of course, the lattice parameters, but also the position of the atoms some uh, isotropy, thermal stuff, and so on, uh, spins, if you need. And uh, you compare with a data set. And uh, the, data, the comparison assumes that you input a, a peak profile. Usually, on a normal read belt, you, you assume this is, these are void functions, which can be asymmetric. And you change the parameter of the void function, of the asymmetric void function, as a, as a function of the UVW parameters of the defector meta. There is a full theory about that, which, is, was, meant, which was done by a guy called uh, Cagliotti uh, a long time ago. But this, as it was done a long time ago, uh, and nobody has ever modernized this infrastructure for, in, in terms of uh, theory, it, it really uh, works for simple instruments. But most of our instruments today are using focusing objects or focusing beams and so on, divergent stuff, uh, and they are not uh, the methodology with a conventional read belt does not really work for modern instruments. So what they do is they tune all this by putting asymmetries everywhere, kind of background shape, something, and so on. And in the end, they, they, they work. They can do read belt refinements. What I propose here, and what is available in ASPIT, is that you input the structural parameters when then they, these are converted into an HKL X squared uh, file, which is used by Nextas in a, in a diffractor meta model using a powder. This one can include the detector efficiency and other things. And then you create a simulated data, test, a data set which has exactly the same shape as a measurement, because you have selected the detector should be from this angle to the other one. And then you can compare. And then it means if you can compare, you can fit. And what you fit is that you do not fit the instrument parameters. What you fit is the structural parameters from the sample. You maintain the instrument fixed because during the measurement, the instrument does not uh, boil. It, it, all, most of the parameters are there. The, you don't change the monochromator height uh, during the, the experiment. So what you do is you then simulate the diffractor gram with iterations like that, refining the parameters from the crystal, and then what you do is, by comparing, you converge to a solution which is the uh, read belt refinement. So you see on, the, on this, uh, sorry, I don't have the, uh, sorry. I don't have the, yeah, I see here. So this is a complete diffractor gram. You can see there's a data set, I think it's on the, it's in red. And you have uh, the initial, and the, uh, so initial in, in green and the final uh, solution in blue. And of course, well, uh, in fact, you can see some red there, but the blue is also going there. But it's just for a rendering issue, but uh, you, it looks like the blue does not completely uh, coincide. But now it's a pixel stuff, you know. But so this fit brings you peaks which have about the same, the same shape as the one you measure. But there's no peak profile there which have, have been implicitly entered in the, in the read belt. It all comes from the instrument itself, just like you would do an experiment. You can see, for instance, that at small angle here, the peak shape is completely asymmetric. It is also the case at the high angle stuff, but it, unfortunately, it's in the background of this image. Uh, I can't show it. Right but also, you have, for, you have for free here the background, the background coming from the sample environment, which was in this model. And there's no fit here. There's no fit, there's no model for the background. It comes from the sample environment and the sample itself, in scattering and all the stuff, aluminum and things like that. So for the same price, you have everything. And it's a fit. So it's just like for the, the, the previous example, it boils down to this time three uh, commands. One to input the data, one to build up the, the record model, which then creates an iFunk model. And this one is built by including the SIF uh, file and the instrument 
plus the next class argument you want. For instance, fixed configuration for the uh, the configuration of the instrument, some distances and things like that. But basically, this would work. And then you do a fit, just like that. Okay. And you then produce also this fit. Uh, the problem is that it is slow. Okay. Compared to a rebuilt, it is slow because it's Monte Carlo. So you have to iterate a number of times. It's noisy. And you need quite some statistics to be able to extract some behavior. So you need still that these, um, you need that these, um, uh, these data sets should not be too noisy. As you cannot compare from one iteration to the other, it, uh, it evolves in all directions. So you still need some uh, statistics. But basically, each iteration, let's say it's a, it's a minute, okay? And you need a few hundred iterations. So you will wait a few hours, and then you will have your real bells. And the convergence is real. It does work. The big shape is there. There is no explicit shape of it. The background is there. And there is no phenomenological parameter. It's all there. It is just your geometry, the sample. So every parameter has a meaning in terms of physics. There's no artificial parameter, as we do in read belt, in conventional read belt. There's no artificial uh, parameter. This methodology, with this read belt function here, this one also works for 2D, 3D data set and LAWE. You can do that the same. It, it's, it, it does uh, the same. It's just that if you work in 3D or in LAWE, of course, um, it could be that you have to wait a longer time because you have to fill a space in the detector, which must contain a lot of events in order to compare with the data set. So you have to shoot more events on the next last side. So it means that each iteration will be longer. But the methodology is there. And as it runs with MPI, if you install that on the cluster, just do it. So it's not perfect because uh, I, in my view, you can never convince people that you should get rid of the conventional read belt. So what should be done is that you start with normal read belt. You get the solution. Then you can input this on this side and try if you can improve things, or vice versa. Okay, they are complementary. So you could do the same with one and the other, and then you can compare. This more, gives more credit to the results. And uh, also, if your instrument is not perfectly known, you, of course, as in real life, uh, then you will be simulating something which does not correspond to the measurements. And then there will be difficulties in comparing. This is true also for the normal read belt, except that the, the conventional read belt has a number of artificial parameters which are there just to cope with what you don't know. And then it's very flexible in terms it can ingest a lot of uncertainty and adapt to a lot of things which are unknown. Uh, when you, when you uh, do a full read belt with Monte Carlo, with a virtual experiment, then the instrument geometry is known. Then it means that if you want to add some uh, flexibility in the instrument, you have to add more parameters. Uh, it could be done. So some parameters which are there to ingest uncertainty. And this can be done as well. There is no hidden parameter in this model, no, not a single one. Everything is just written in stone. This is, these are dimensions, distances, the sample, sample environment, that's all. OK? And this is it. OK? So we can see, in the meantime, uh, the optimizer is still going on. OK? You see it's still going on. Uh, since the beginning, you can see that the divergence pattern is getting stronger there on the, on the, at the sample uh, position because we are now converging. So there was a, a good solution found uh, at the previous step. You can see the best solution is here, and we started there. So during my talk, we already had the factor two improvement in flux at the sample. Okay. Thank you. Emmanuel, I, was, I remember we, we, we wrote together an article for Journal of Newton Research 10 years ago about virtual experiments and, and what we should do. And I think that you are very far along that. I'm progressing in this direction. Yes. Yeah. So my next step is I want to do the same with uh, a full inelastic time of flight, so four-dimensional space. I want to demonstrate this is possible. That is. I will, in a way, use kind of arrays in there to import data and be able to re reconstruct the four-dimensional space. I have the models in 4D, 
But I also need the four dimensional resolution function from the instrument, which nobody does effectively. Everybody does just a one dimensional Gaussian in energy. That's what people do to take into account the resolution. As, in fact, what happens is that if you select the tube in the detector, the resolution in Q changes. It's just like on a triple axis machine, except it's not exactly the same analytical approach. But if you're using Monte Carlo, you can evaluate the resolution function everywhere in the brilliant zone. And then you can fit with the resolution everywhere and fit in one single command. Yeah, this can be done. So there will be new requirements on the uh, computational power, of course. But this is just computational power. The computers are there to be used. <coughs> and in terms of uh, thinking, all the breaks, I know how to do them. And I'm already, I have already started to do that. That's okay. So the triple axis stuff, I, I made that in six months. Okay. Just to give you an idea. Yeah. Very nice. So um, you mentioned that it's hard to sell, uh, you know, new methods. Yes. Instead of the old uh, methods. So are users actually adopting these methods, or no. is it is it doing? Uh, Only the triple axis guys, because they are in a position where they have no more data analysis for their mm -hmm. data. And then, as there was a lack, and I must say, Mantid is not covering this part. Then there was a free set of uh, a niche, I would say, kind of a free area, a nest where I can sit. It's warm, and uh, I can develop. <laughs> and I know that the, uh, the users or the scientists are in need of that. They are requesting that, because it's something they have been dreaming for 50 years. At some point, in, I would say in the 90s, some tools were performing this type of approaches, not as evolved, but at least all the bricks were there. Uh, tools which were using rest tracks or things of this kind. But, but since about nearly 20 to 30 years, this knowledge has been lost because uh, you find less and less people that are able to understand both the physics in terms of really the physics, not just an expression. Really the physics, the instruments, and be able to program. So it means all these codes that were developed in the uh, 90s have been abandoned. So they are not functional anymore. And that's why the triple axis guys are in need. And today, what they do is that they just do Gaussian fits. Ah, no, I don't do that. So I, 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 I made this tool for them, and they are now started that, and it's been installed on all the triple axis machines at the ILS these days. And my plan is now to expand this to flat, uh, to flat cone geometries multiplexed, which is kind of Kamea, Bifrost, and so on, it's the same. And in conjunction with the time of flight machines like uh, Merlin or things like that, then there will be a complete set of tools, treats, uh, four dimensional spaces, and measurements with the resolution and with advanced models. This is what I want to do. And I believe this is within reach, I would say, within a year. In a year, you will have that. Cool. Well, what, what do the users get out of it for the, for the, uh, the TAS example? If you have a four-dimensional volume of yes. uh, the aluminium photons, and so a one-dimensional scan. Uh, scan across that volume, yes. what, what do they present it with? Do they have so their data, and it's so, so they have the data set. Out of the four yeah. They have the data set, but they are able to represent the data set in four dimensions or in three dimensions, and to show the local dispersion around their measurements. So either this comes from a DFT, and in principle you can even show the full Green zone, or it comes from a local description of the dispersions, and then they can, from a single measurement, using the asymmetry of the of the peaks then they can extract a hidden information which is given by the curvature, the local curvature of the dispersion. That is, from their scan, they also have the, they have the intersection of the dispersion with the resolution volume, but they also have the curvature, the local curvature around this, this intersection. That is, they have more information than what they would get from a, a Gaussian fit, because then they, they completely project 
They, if they do a one-dimensional fit, then they project everything. They lose the four-dimensional information. From the four-dimensional fit, then they have a local description in four dimensions. They have the three curvatures in Q. So they get the parameters from a model. So for DFT, the problem is that there are very few parameters. This is DFT ab initio. It's, if it's ab initio, then uh, you just say, just do it, and uh, you have no nothing to tune. If it's a local expansion, you can change the slopes and so on. But it's much. Uh, what I've seen is that the triple S's guy likes the local expansion. It's very simple, and and they can adapt it to any geometry uh, for the dispersions. It can work for phonons, for spin waves. It's just a local expansion, so it's very simple. If you give them a phonon from DFT, well, the structure is fixed, so it means the distances of the HKL, the black peaks are fixed in space. The energies, in principle, are fixed because they are given by the masses and the, and the uh, eigenvectors of the Hamiltonians. But what you, uh, what, what I have been putting is a small scaling parameters so that you can still slightly adapt the energies of the modes so that they can play with something else. They are, it's very frustrating because you have a very complex model, high, plenty of uh, nice knowledge, and you cannot change it. So you cannot do a fit. So you need a fit. to do a fit, you need something to change. So you can change the temperature, things like the width of the uh, so the, the damping of the modes. Yeah. You can and then that, and then you can also change slightly the scaling, that is the energy level of the mode. And usually you only measure one or two modes, so you can can change your scaling as freely. You don't need to see how your optical mode evolves. Of course, it will be also expanding in energy, but as you only measure one, you will say okay. It looks like my local curvature is like that. You can represent the curvature. You can get some information out of that. Exploit the density of state if you want to, and so on. Because you have complete knowledge. Yeah. Um, has this affected the sort of measurement strategy the triple axis use? Is it not just a line anymore, so but scattered around it? Or? As I said, this tool is only there since uh, early January this year. Okay. So they are starting to use that. Uh, and it's LL is just like everywhere else. People are just busy, so you say there's a new tool, just use it. Okay, yeah, yeah, let's meet together. So we see, we meet together. I show them. Okay, you can do like that. They try it, then they go to a lot of us, and then we come two weeks later and they say, Ah, yeah, I would like to. I would love to try it again. So I have to <laughs> make a new uh, meeting to force them to, or not to force them, but to incite them to use it, to show them the benefits. So what happens is that the students are learning that. They are using that. The instrument scientists have no time to do that. And that's why they just don't spend much time. But they, they come to the meetings, and they have value, very valuable information or comments on what they want to do, uh, if they want to modify things, how they would do, what, what are missing features, things like that. And this is very important. So it takes time. It will take time. It's a tool which is clearly beyond what has been done in the past, at least for triple axis. And I can understand that. So it takes time for people to learn, to make their own mind that, in fact, it's not so complex to use. OK? Yeah. So unfortunately, this is made in MATLAB. But there is a layer in, uh, in Python. There are other parts which are important. I mix everything. I don't invent the wheel. <laughs> I want things to be, yeah, sorry for that. Uh, but I'm nearly alone on this project. So I, I, I want to minimize first the maintenance. I want to prototype very fast. And I want something which is a final product being usable by users. So all of these requirements make that I cannot uh, reinvent the wheel. I have to use bricks which exist everywhere. And I just uh, assemble that. It, 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 this is a significant task. This is a lot of time. Uh, but it works. What counts is not the language or the methodology. It's if you can deliver something at some point. This is what counts. Then, if you want to do it in Python or in C++, just do it. You get the code. It's all there. It's open source. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's, a, it's a small. Yeah, yeah. Simply a matter of programming. 
the converter. Yes. You write the converter in Lekanyak and then uh, run it. Yeah, converter. <laughs> Ouch. Yeah. Good. Yes, that's it. Excellent. No, thanks so much, Rob. Okay. Thank you very much. Good. Thank you. So, if you really want to try it, uh, it's on the web, and I can help you also to do that. Of course, the latest version on the web um, does not. It's a version 1.8 of iFit. It does not contain everything I've been developing since then. So for nearly a year, something like that. So, but I have um, the source code contains everything. So if you have MATLAB, and I, I'm sure some of you have it, then uh, you can try just by grabbing the code, or I can get some copy. Isn't there the 1.9 beta? There's one. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 If you go on the download area, I'll find it. You'll find. There's a beta. Um, I'm working on the um, the way to use the symmetries when you compute the components to minimize the number of displacements uh, at the DFT level. And ASC these days they don't use the symmetries. And uh, using the space loop, uh, you can minimize a lot of things. So it makes sense, but uh, they did not do it. There is a space group object. Uh, this is true. So I'm using that. Uh, that's why these days I'm doing uh, Python essentially. Excellent. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you again. Yeah. Stop the recording. Stop sharing. Yeah, that's one. And that's then you one. need to go to the browser. Yeah. Browser. And you press the stop. No, 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 no. This one. Yes.